So welcome back, everyone, uh, to panel two of uh, CIL's conference on UNCLOS at 14 assessment. Panel two talks about UNCLOS as a living instrument for the next century. Uh, the moderator of um, panel two is Prof. Uh, Chao Ke Yen. He is a distinguished professor of law at the Dalian Maritime University, China, as well as the Harris Professor Emeritus of International Law University of Central Lancashire. United Kingdom. He specializes in international law, in law of the sea, and international environmental law. Um, his distinguished bio is available online, so I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at it. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, again, a repetition of the housekeeping rules. Uh, for our Zoom participants, please uh, keep yourself on mute when not speaking. Um, while we had early encouraged everyone to turn on their videos, we understand that for bandwidth purposes, you may not be able to do so. Again, to get the best experience of the conference, we would encourage you to please wear your headphones and to turn on the speaker's view. And uh, please feel free to share questions and comments on the chat box or raise your virtual hand during the discussion portion. The uh, panelists uh, have 15 minutes each and I will be ringing the bell, although I was not subject to it earlier, I will be ring ringing the bell uh, at 13 minutes to indicate that you have two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Without further ado, Prof. Joe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carla, for your very kind introduction. And uh, I'm very sorry, uh, feel sorry that I could not join you in Singapore in person uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, actually, I miss uh, Singapore very much. And uh, as we know, uh, we listened uh, uh, to the first panel about the in uh, in institutions. Now we move to the instrument. And uh, this is not an uh, ordinary instrument, it's a living instrument. And uh, as we know that the UNCLOS is described as the constitution for the oceans. And uh, in the sense that it covers comprehensively almost all ocean matters and uh, ranging, uh, ranging from uh, establishment of maritime zones to the protection of the marine environment. A lot of issues there. And also it is a living instrument in the sense that it's developing and it's expanding after its adoption. And uh, as we know that uh, uh, there are already two existing in uh, uh, agreements the 1994 agreement and the 1995 agreement already mentioned in the first panel and also in the keynote speech uh, delivered by Judge Hoffman. And uh, our panel uh, has four distinguished uh, uh, panelists and uh, we have a lawyer, uh, we have a lawyer, we have a judge and we have a senior diplomat and also we have a senior scholar. So it's a perfect combination. Uh, for this panel and also for the law, law of the sea studies. And the first of all, I would like to introduce briefly about uh, Judge Thomas Heider, the first panelist uh, speaker. And uh, Judge Heider is uh, currently a judge at Italos and also a vice president uh, of, the, of that tribunal. Before that, he was legal advisor to the foreign uh, ministry of Iceland. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Judge Hyde also published extensively on ocean affairs and the law of the sea, including his recent book, New Knowledge and uh, Changing Circumstances in the Law of the Sea. So, uh, uh, Judge Hyde, uh, his topic today is challenges to the law of the sea. So, without further ado, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Judge Hyde. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I, would, I would like to thank my friend Nullifer Oral for, uh, and the Center for International Law for the invitation to speak at this important conference. I'm very pleased to share this panel with Professor Zhu and with Penelope Ridings, Rena Lee, and Joanna Mossop, who I know all very well. 
Unfortunately, I cannot be with you in person in, in beautiful Singapore. And I'm speaking from the tribunal in, in Hamburg, which is now in session. Let me turn on my, my slides. So the title of my uh, short talk is, How does the law of the sea adapt to new challenges? As you know, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention was a carefully balanced package deal. It goes without saying that it is imperative to preserve the integrity of the convention by maintaining that package deal intact. This could easily be compromised by selective amendments to the convention. However, it was also emphasized already at the third conference that changes could occur and new developments might take place, which could affect the subject matter of parts of the convention. Accordingly, the provisions of the convention should be adapted to such changes. Like any other living instrument, the convention must adapt to changing circumstances. During the four decades that have passed since the convention was negotiated, there has been considerable advancement in scientific knowledge and technology in a number of fields addressed in the convention. At the same time, fundamental environmental changes are taking place as a consequence of global warming, including, but not limited to, sea level rise. Obviously, these developments pose challenges to the law of the sea framework. And the question is, how do states and other actors cope with those challenges? What are the possibilities for adapting the legal framework to such challenges? I will address this question in six parts. First, <clears throat> the Law of the Sea Convention provides a number of formal amendment procedures, which are either generally applicable, Articles 312 and 313, or deal with a specific subject matter, Article 314. To cut a long story short, the convention has never been amended pursuant to these formal amendment procedures. The reasons are probably twofold. On the one hand, it may be difficult to achieve expeditious adoption, and in particular, entry into force of formal amendments to the convention, given the stringent requirements, therefore. On the other hand, states parties are likely hesitant to propose amendments as it may open the door for other amendments and risk undermining the package deal. However, and this is my second point, <clears throat> the, so the two so-called implementing agreements, the 1994 Part 11 Agreement and the 1995 UN-FISTOS Agreement have de facto modified or amended the Convention or the Law of the Sea Framework. The Part 11 Agreement was negotiated to address several difficulties which many industrialized countries had raised with respect to the seabed mining provisions contained in Part 11, and thereby paved the way for universal participation in the Convention regime. The agreement provides quite innovative procedures that serve to ensure an integral relationship between the agreement and the Convention. While its title refers to implementation, the agreement goes well beyond implementation and effectively amends several provisions of Part 11 of the Convention. The UN FISTOS Agreement was, nego was negotiated to strengthen the relevant provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention, which were considered to be too general and wake, and thus react to serious problems of overfishing on the high seas in the 80s and the 90s. Differently from the Part 11 agreement, the UN FISTOS Agreement is a standalone agreement, and a state may become a party to it without becoming a party to the Convention, and vice versa. However, this does not change the fact that the agreement and the Convention are closely related. Although the agreement does not amend the Convention per se, it strengthens considerably the Convention framework for high seas fisheries and develops international law in this area significantly. 
the agreement incorporates a number of important novelties and goes clearly beyond what is provided in the convention. Currently, a third agreement under the Law of the Convention is being negotiated, with, which will most probably take the form of an implementing agreement, the so-called BPMJ agreement. It is probable that this new agreement will go beyond mere implementation, like its two pre predecessors. However, it is important to note that the mandate of the conference to negotiate the agreement was explicitly predicated upon the need to ensure, first, that the work and results of the conference should be fully consistent with the provisions of the convention, and second, that the process and its result should not undermine existing relevant legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional and sectoral bodies. <clears throat> Thirdly, the Law of the Sea Convention includes several other mechanisms through which its adaptation may take place. It provides, for example, for the obligation of states acting through competent international organizations to establish relevant international rules and standards. In many cases, the rules and standards adopted by these organizations are incorporated by reference into the convention regime, the so-called rule of reference. The two most relevant international organizations in this respect are the IMO and the FAO, both specialized agencies of the United Nations predating the convention. Regional organizations also play a role in the implementation of the convention and related agreements, in particular regional fisheries management organizations, RFMOs, and regional environmental organizations, REOs. The UN General Assembly, which undertakes annually a global review of activities in the area of oceans and the law of the sea, is also relevant in adapting the law of the sea framework to new developments. In particular, its annual resolutions on oceans and the law of the sea and on fisheries, although soft law, can play a role in this respect. The Law of the Sea Convention provides in Article 319 for the convening of meetings of states parties to the convention, SPLOS. And it created also three international institutions, the ISA, ITLOS, and the CLCS. The convention entrusts a regulatory role to the institutions in their respective areas. The convention only assigns certain financial and administrative tasks to SPLOS explicitly but this has not prevented SPLOS from taking decisions that are de facto amendments to the convention. For example, in light of the challenges that developing countries in particular face in preparing a submission to the CLCS, SPLOS has adopted decisions postponing the first deadline for submissions and providing for the submission of preliminary information to the commission to break the, the deadline. The reason why the form of decisions by SPLOS was preferred in those instances to the formal amendment procedures of the convention that I mentioned earlier is probably that the latter would have been too burdensome and time consuming. The ISA has been entrusted in part 11 of the convention with inter alia adopting rules, regulations and procedures relating to the exploration and exploitation of mineral resources in the area. The ISA has made significant progress in the regulation of exploration of various categories of deep seabed minerals and is currently developing regulations on the exploitation phase. ITLOS was given the task in Article 16 of its statute, which forms Annex 6 to the Convention, to adopt rules for carrying out its functions. The rules of ITLOS were adopted in 1997 and have been amended a few times. The rules clarify inter alia the advisory jurisdiction of the tribunal on the basis of Article 21 of the statute. Although the convention does not empower the CLCS explicitly to adopt rules of procedure or other instruments, such competence may be implied as being necessary for the carrying out of its functions. The CLCS has adopted two important instruments, first in 1999, it adopted the scientific and technical guidelines, 
which explain how the CLCS understands terms and provisions of Article 76 of the Convention. Second, the CLCS adopted its rules of procedure and the latest version is from 2008. Among the issues dealt with in the rules of procedure are submissions in case of land or maritime disputes. Fourth, other agreements between states, for example, bilateral and regional agreements, provide an important part of the law of the sea framework. A recent example is the agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean, which was signed by 10 parties in 2018. The high seas area in the Central Arctic Ocean, which is the size of the Mediterranean, has until recently been covered with sea ice. Consequently, no fisheries have taken place, and there is very limited knowledge on fish stocks and ecosystems in the area. However, with the impacts of climate change, ocean warming and ice melting, it was considered that the area might open up to fisheries in the near future. The Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which is a textbook example of the implementation of the UN Fisheries Agreement, and in particular the precautionary approach, is intended to avert a serious problem before it arises. Fifth, state practice and development of customary international law can play an important role in adapting the law of the sea to changing circumstances. In some cases, such an approach may be preferred to that of formal amendment procedures or the negotiation of a new instrument. The legal effects of sea level rise due to climate change currently under the consideration of the International Law Commission may potentially represent such an issue. And finally, uh, sixth, international courts and tribunals may clarify and develop the law of the sea framework in light of new scientific and technical knowledge and changing circumstances. The main task of ITLOS, as well as the ICJ and arbitral tribunals under the convention, is of course to settle disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. However, in some cases, they may have an opportunity to clarify the law of the sea, which not only benefits the parties to the relevant case, but also the international community as a whole. In addition to contentious jurisdiction, the tribunal and its seabed disputes chamber have advisory jurisdiction. Advisory opinions serve to interpret and clarify the relevant provisions of the convention, related agreements, and other international law. The 2011 advisory opinion of the CPET Disputes Chamber on responsibilities and obligations of states sponsoring persons and entities with respect to activities in the area clarified the relevant provisions of Part 11 and related international law. In a very comprehensive opinion, the Chamber addressed inter alia the precautionary approach and the due diligence obligations of sponsoring states. The 2015 advisory opinion of the tribunal on the request of the Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission concerned in particular IU fishing in Western Africa. Although the Law of the Sea Convention does not contain any direct provisions on flag state obligations with respect to IU fishing, it was clarified and developed the due diligence obligation of the flag state to take appropriate measures in order to ensure that vessels flying its flag are not engaged in IU fishing activities in the exclusive economic zones of other states. It's interesting to note that in his separate opinion, in that case, Judge Peck referred to the rule of reference, took the view that post-1982 legal developments, including the UN Fisheries Agreement, give content to the generally accepted international regulations, procedures, and practices referred to in Article 94, Paragraph 5 of the Convention, which form the due diligence requirements of the flag state. Advisory opinions may be particularly suitable means to clarify the law of the sea in light of new scientific findings and changing environmental circumstances due to climate change. The law of the sea convention was drafted in an era 
when concerns over anthropogenic changes to the climate were not high on the international agenda. As a result, the convention does not contain any provisions that explicitly address climate change. However, <clears throat> this does not necessarily mean that obligations under the convention, for example, in part 12, do not cover matters impacting climate change. The international community might benefit from an advisory opinion clarifying the extent to which obligations under the convention cover matters impacting climate change. To conclude, although the formal amendment procedures of the Law 3 Convention have never been applied, there are various other means by which the Convention and the Law 3 framework more generally have been adapted to the challenges of new knowledge and changing circumstances. While it is imperative to ensure stability and preserve the integrity of the Convention and the packet steel it represents, it is indeed a living instrument which is capable of coping with new challenges. And here, international courts and tribunals have an important role to play. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Judge uh, Haider, for your excellent uh, presentation. And Judge uh, Haider gave us an uh, overview of the UNCLOS as a living instrument and uh, cover, covering a lot of uh, aspects uh, from uh, implementing agreements to the rule of international uh, courts and the tribunals. Very, uh, very stimulating and also very insightful. And then now we move to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Penelope Riding. She's a barrister and international lawyer, and also she's uh, recently elected as a member of the International Law Commission uh, starting from next year. And he's a member of the IC, uh, ICSID and also legal advisor to the Western and the Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. And uh, before, before that, she was the ambassador of New Zealand to Poland and the three uh, Baltic states. So, uh, Dr. Ridings, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Zhou. I would like to first thank the uh, chairman of the board and the director, Nelifa Oral, uh, of the Center for International Law uh, for this excellent conference. Uh, and uh, I'm very uh, much appreciate the invitation uh, to speak on this panel uh, about UNCLOS as a living instrument for the next century. Uh, as we've already heard today, the Law of the Sea Convention is the constitution of the oceans. And it can be interpreted and elaborated, but not contradicted. It's an instrument that's able to evolve over time to address new and contemporary challenges. And Judge Haider has already highlighted uh, the different ways in which instruments can evolve over time and uh, has pointed to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement as representing one of those ways, a specific agreement which implements UNCLOS. And it can also be seen as a living instrument in itself. So my presentation looks at both these aspects, uh, but first I want to briefly provide a little background to the Fish Stocks Agreement. You will know that there are many different global fish stocks, some of which pose conservation and management challenges. Highly migratory fish stocks such as tuna, swordfish, and oceanic sharks regularly travel long distances through both high seas and areas under national jurisdiction. Straddling stocks such as cod, pollock, mackerel, and squid occur both within a country's EEZ and in the adjacent high seas area. UNCLOS addressed highly migratory uh, species and straddling fish stocks in a general way. 
While providing for the freedom to fish on the high seas, it also required states to cooperate in the management of highly migratory and straddling fish stocks. In this way, it sought to achieve the balance of interests between coastal states and those states that fish on the high seas. But it didn't provide detailed instructions on how to balance these interests or how to manage these stocks. In the decade after UNCLOS was concluded, fishing on the high seas expanded and stocks declined. There were valuable stocks such as pollock in the Northwest Atlantic and cod in the Bering Sea, which collapsed. Tuna stocks such as Atlantic bluefin and Southern bluefin tuna were in a poor state. There was concern within the international community that unregulated fishing on the high seas was contributing significantly to the collapse of fish stocks. These concerns led the 1992 Rio conference to recommend the convening of an intergovernmental conference to promote effective implementation of the provisions of UNCLOS on straddling and highly migratory fish stocks. Importantly, this was to be consistent with the provisions of UNCLOS, in particular, the rights and obligations of coastal states and states fishing on the high seas. The UN Fish Stocks Agreement is the result. Negotiations concluded in 1995 and the agreement entered into force in 2001. After a slow start, 20 years later, it has 91 state parties. I want to touch on the areas uh, where the Fish Stocks Agreement has elaborated on UNCLOS. And it did this in three ways. First, it filled the skeletal provisions of UNCLOS with additional detail. Second, it supplemented this detail through elaborating principles to guide future approaches to fisheries conservation and management. And third, it set up an implementation framework which addressed how the new legal requirements were to be implemented. So the Fish Stocks Agreement is a framework for international cooperation and a blueprint for fisheries conservation and management. And this has allowed it to become a living instrument in itself, which I'll come back to later. But first, I want to consider how the agreement has filled out the skeleton of UNCLOS and how it has expanded on its existing cooperation provisions. UNCLOS is based on the fundamental principle that states should cooperate in taking the measures necessary for conservation and management of highly migratory fish stocks. Coastal states and fishing nations should also seek to agree on measures for the conservation and management of straddling stocks in adjacent high seas areas. While UNCLOS provided for cooperation, it did not provide the detail on what precisely cooperation should entail. The Fish Stocks Agreement provides that detail. Cooperation should be realized through the adoption of conservation and management measures applicable to particular fish stocks. These measures should be based on best scientific evidence available and sustainability requirements. The agreement also seeks to maintain the balance between the interests of coastal states and fishing nations by providing that measures adopted for areas under national jurisdiction and those established in the adjacent high seas should be compatible. It provides detail on what is required to implement conservation and management measures. In particular, responsibility is placed squarely on flag states for their vessels on the high seas. They should ensure that all fishing on the high seas is authorized that it has mechanisms to control the activities of its vessels, including through requiring catch and effort data, the monitoring systems, and the investigation and imposition of penalties, where there have been violations of regional fisheries conservation measures. The agreement also recognizes the need to cooperate by taking into account the special requirements of developing states in relation to conservation and management. It provides for an assistance fund to be set up to assist developing states in the implementation of the agreement. So second, the Fish Stocks Agreement elaborated new principles and norms which can be used to guide future approaches to fisheries conservation and management. And this has enriched the law of the sea. 
Of particular importance is the requirement for the application of the precautionary approach and the need to be cautious when scientific information is uncertain, unreliable or inadequate. The agreement also sets out the need to take measures to minimize the adverse impact of fisheries on associated and dependent species and the importance of adopting an ecosystem approach to management. One of the values of the agreement is that it is a set of standards for the conservation and sustainable use of marine living resources. A set of standards to which states and fisheries organizations should aspire. Many countries have adopted its principles on the use of precaution, the use of the best scientific information available and assessing the impact of fisheries on the wider ecosystem. The third, and among the most important aspects of the Fish Stocks Agreement is that it set up an implementation framework to address how the new legal requirements for cooperation are to be pursued. It established that the primary vehicle for cooperation between coastal states and high seas fishing states is through regional fisheries management organizations or RFMOs. RFMOs therefore have a crucial role in implementing the agreement. Five new regional fisheries management organizations have been created since the agreement was adopted in 1995. They are all closely based on the provisions of the Fish Stocks Agreement. And also the provisions of some existing regional fisheries agreements have been amended in light of the agreement. For example, the Antigua Convention was adopted in 2003 to update the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Convention in order to incorporate the fish stock principles. The new RFMOs together with the existing RFMOs have expanded the web of conservation and management measures for highly migratory and straddling fish stocks. So the, fishing, the fish stocks agreement can also be seen as a living instrument in itself. This has occurred not only through the framework of RFMOs, but also through the institutional mechanisms that have been established pursuant to the agreement. Like UNCLOS itself, the, the, the agreement does not provide for a COP. It does provide for a meeting of states parties. However, informal consultations of states parties to the agreement were established pursuant it did not provide for meeting states parties, but informal conservation consultations of state parties to the agreement were established pursuant to a decision of the General Assembly following the entry into force of the agreement. These consultations have been a useful forum for the exchange of information and the identification of best practices. And it's also been the forum for discussions on the implementation of the agreement, not only among states parties, but among UN members. The outcomes have then flowed into the annual consultations in the UN General Assembly on Oceans and Law of the Sea and Sustainable Fisheries. The agreement also provides for a review conference to be convened within four years after entry into force. The review conference and its resumed sessions have assessed the adequacy of the provisions of the agreement. And it may also propose means of strengthening the substance and methods of implementation of its provisions. An issue that arose early on was how to deal with discrete high sea stocks, for example, stocks of demersal species, which occur only in the high seas. And while there's been suggestions that the fish stocks agreement should be supplemented by a protocol dealing with high sea stocks, this did not occur. Rather, the General Assembly has called on states and RFMOs to extend the principles of the agreement to all fish stocks stocks that are not straddling or migratory, but those found in the deep oceans or on the high seas. The General Assembly has also addressed the need to protect habitats and vulnerable marine ecosystems from the impact of fishing, particularly bottom fishing. RFMOs have played a role in taking the General Assembly initiatives forward. RFMOs have proven to be a mechanism to progress the international law of the sea by responding to emerging problems. So some have established marine protected areas, such as the marine protected area in the Ross Sea. The Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission has started to address 
the problem of poor labor conditions on fishing vessels, as well as marine pollution. But I think we would agree that there were still significant issues for the conservation and management of global fish stocks. The overall status of straddling fish stocks is mixed. Some individual tuna stocks face significant issues, even though due to intensive management, two thirds of all types of tuna are now fished at biologically sustainable levels. Moreover, significant issues remain. In the interest of time, I will just list these. They include effectively addressing illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. The problem of effectively managing transshipments at sea. The conservation and management of sharks, including the practice of shark finning. The conservation of other associated species, such as mobulids and rays and turtles. The prevalence of subsidies, which contribute to excess fishing capacity, overfishing and IUU fishing. The disproportionate burden of conservation and management on developing countries. The problem of lost or abandoned fishing gear and marine debris. Labor conditions on fishing vessels. And the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification on global fisheries. There was much more work to be done, but the framework of both principles and an implementation mechanism is there. Action should now concentrate on making the best use of the fish stocks agreement and the framework it creates so that it can address new and contemporary issues over the next 40 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ridings, for, uh, for your very comprehensive review of the fishing uh, fish stocks agreement, and they cover a lot of uh, aspects of this uh, of the implementation of this agreement, uh, from the implement implementing framework and to the uh, regional fisheries management uh, organizations. You cover the MPA and IUU fishing and all these things. And uh, very good. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, now we move to the third speaker. Um, Ambassador Lina Lee. Uh, she's, uh, she's a very senior diplomat uh, working in the Singapore Foreign Ministry. And uh, she's a decent recently chaired in the, as a president of the BBNJ uh, negotiations and uh, chairing the current uh, BBNJ negotiations. So she's a very uh, key figure to, uh, to, uh, uh, to delect, delect the, the negotiations process. She's also a member of the Legal and Technical uh, Commission of the International Civil Authority and uh, de definitely she uh, will talk about uh, recent uh, PBNJ negotiations. Uh, Ambassador Lee, and the floor is yours now. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Zhou, and um, a very good afternoon to excellencies, judges, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and those dialing in uh, remotely. I'm uh, very happy to uh, be here. Uh, I just decided, I hope you forgive me, I decided I wouldn't walk to the podium and I'll just sit here and, uh, and, uh, and weigh in. So first of all, um, I wanted to thank uh, the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore, um, in particular, Professor Tommy Cole, as well as Dr. Nilufa Oral for um, inviting me to participate in this, um, uh, in this conference on uh, UNCLOS at 40 um, and assessment. But because our panel is about UNCLOS as a living instrument and we're looking ahead, so I will be looking into the future. Um, maybe a little bit of background first um, on the BBNJ uh, negotiations. Um, it, is, uh, it is intended to, uh, uh, I think actually many people here, and I don't know who's in the audience, but I'm going to guess that quite a few people in the audience did follow uh, the BBNJ negotiations and know about it. 
but the um, the inter intergovernmental conference on BBNG has a very long title. Um, is really um, mandated to uh, develop and uh, what uh, we in the process call the ILBI or the International Legally Binding Instrument under UNCLOS um, uh, to develop uh, an instrument on um, biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, it will take a package approach that's part of our mandate, which will cover four elements, uh, marine genetic resources, including the sharing of benefits, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, um, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. And these elements are meant to be uh, decided as a package deal. So what I'm going to um, what I'm going to do because the title um, of the presentation is the BBNJ negotiations is really to um, give you an update on the uh, BBNJ uh, negotiations and look forward. And this is literally hot off the press because uh, we just concluded our fourth session um, a little over a week ago. Um, and therefore, I think uh, it's, it's still fresh in uh, many people's minds. Um, but I thought I would set out for the benefit of those who were not able to participate in the process, um, what, uh, where we find ourselves and, um, and what we have to look forward to. So where we are in the process, as I said, we have just finished um, the fourth session. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the mandate, you will know that only four sessions were mandated by the General, Est uh, General Assembly when it decided to convene um, the Intergovernmental Conference. Although um, I do note that the, the resolution actually says initially for 2018, 2019 and 2020. So what we will be doing is that um, we will be seeking a General Assembly decision to convene a fifth session in August of this year. And indications are it's likely to be in the second half of August in New York. Um, and that's really um, uh, where we are right now. Um, in terms of how the fourth session went, uh, as you know, and I think many of you know that the fourth session was originally slated to happen in, um, in April of 2020. Um, but, because, um, but because of the pandemic, we were forced to postpone it. Um, and uh, we postponed it uh, twice, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, when it came to the time to um, consider the convening of the fourth session, in consultation with my bureau members, uh, we decided that despite the restrictions that were placed on us as a result of the pandemic, that we would proceed with the fourth, uh, we would proceed with the fourth session. Um, but because there were many restrictions, uh, entering the fourth session, I think, was quite, I think it's quite fair to say that there was a certain degree of scepticism around how the fourth session would proceed and uh, around how we would make progress um, um, at, the, um, at the fourth session. But I think that where we ended up was, uh, uh, where we ended up, I think most delegations um, uh, were of the view that we did make progress um, during the fourth session. Uh, I think uh, uh, the value of the fourth session was really to imbue uh, delegations with the confidence that actually we can do it and we can uh, end this in sight. I mean, there's still a lot more work to be done. But uh, we, we can actually see movement uh, and we can actually see uh, uh, developments. And so, you know, I want to take this opportunity here to really appreciate um, the delegations um, for, for um, trusting me uh, and taking the plunge into going into negotiations and um, uh, uh, really um, jumping straight into the work. Um, I did a fairly undiplomatic thing by saying there'll be no opening statements, we go straight into work. And I'm very um, appreciative that uh, delegations um, uh, uh, um, were, were, you know, um, 
supportive uh, in uh, proceeding in this uh, manner. And I think one thing you will see um, as a result of the fourth session is a kind of a deeper level of engagement uh, between the delegations and really seeing uh, the emergence of quite a number of joint proposals um, uh, between a delegation, something that I've been calling for for the last two years during the intersessional um, period. Um, and we're really beginning to see the fruits of the, uh, the work done during the intersessional period. Um, ironically, um, actually, I think the break did help delegations to really drill down and really um, enhance their understanding of the, um, of the different issues. And so um, delegations uh, came prepared to really um, see what were the areas in which we could, uh, uh, we could come together. Um, so I will say, um, um, so I will say that it is um, important that delegations uh, um, hold on to the momentum that we had during the two weeks in New York to continue to engage with one another intersessionally um, uh, in order to really make that big push um, at the fifth session uh, in August this year. And really, um, I will say that um, at this point in time, we can see the broad contours um, of the text. Um, I undertook to, um, I undertook to uh, produce a revised draft text by early May. Um, um, I, uh, and I gave um, delegations the deadline of 31st uh, March to submit proposals. Um, so what I'm going to say subsequently may change after I've waded my way through what are apparently over 600 pages of um, proposals. Uh, but this is my initial... <laughs> uh, well, this is what emerged um, from the fourth session, but uh, uh, obviously I'm going to um, spend a lot of time um, going through the proposals and um, seeing where are the possible areas in which member states can begin to coalesce um, into developing uh, consensus because it is my intention to try and push us all into a consensus. So first on the sharing, mar uh, marine genetic uh, resources and the sharing of benefits, I think we still do have uh, work to do in relation to the characterization of collection, utilization, access and utilization of marine genetic resources. But in terms of um, management, uh, um, and, I, and I use this term fairly deliberately, um, the direction of travel appears to be emerging that we will operate on the basis of a notification system. A notification pre-cruise, uh, by which I mean not holiday cruise, but research cruise, um, and then a post-cruise um, report. Um, in terms of the sharing of benefits, I think there are some... Um, there's some broad level of agreement in terms of the need for mandatory sharing of benefits on a fair and equitable basis where the benefits are non-monetary. Uh, but uh, we do need to resolve the issues around the sharing of monetary benefits. Um, and we also will continue to have to work um, on the mechanism for the delivery of the sharing of benefits. And in this regard, there are two sort of broad uh, competing uh, mechanisms uh, being tabled. Um, and I hope that delegations will take this um, period to study the different mechanisms and continue their conversations um, around them. For area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, and really as a follow-up to uh, what uh, Tara had presented uh, in the first panel around the need for um, around the need to avoid or minimize fragmentation to enhance uh, cooperation and coordination. Uh, and, and really uh, a coherence uh, amongst all the different um, all the different bodies that have uh, some mandate uh, in in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, this uh, I think it really comes out uh, in in this element of area-based management tools, including marine protect uh, marine protected areas. And while there appears to be some broad understanding of the approach. 
um, uh, I think there will be uh, there needs to be work done on the relative roles of states, parties, um, as well as the conference of the parties uh, and the decision making process. Uh, particularly, what happens um, where there are what uh, in the process we call IFBs, instruments, frameworks, and bodies, and what happens when there are none. Um, but I do, um, I do see uh, states uh, beginning to, uh, beginning to come a little closer um, uh, in terms of their understanding of how a potential process might work. Uh, in terms of uh, environmental impact assessments, um, I think it's no secret. I've said this uh, quite a few times before. I think the section in the revised draft text on this is a little too long. Um, because it does uh, contain uh, many details um, and I think those of you who are involved in the process will know that I'm, uh, um, I'm advocating directions but not details. Uh, but the focus I think for environmental impact assessments really will be in terms of the trigger. As you know, Article 206 does cover environmental impact assessments, whether we operate on that single threshold or some delegations are advocating a tiered approach. Um, and also, what is the degree of internationalization uh, that we can anticipate in, in terms of conducting uh, environmental impact assessments? And I think an area where we have to uh, probably work a little bit more is really in terms of strategic environmental um, assessments. Uh, for capacity building and transfer of marine technology, time really flies. Uh, for capacity building and transfer of marine technologies, I think really uh, um, the issues, as I mentioned during the conference, are not insurmountable where this is concerned, but we do need to have some landing on the nature of the obligation for delivery of capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Now, in terms of institutional arrangements, I think we're, um, there seems to be broad agreement to establish a conference of the parties, um, a subsidiary, a scientific and technical body, a clearinghouse mechanism, and a secretariat. Um, but obviously, details uh, will have to be worked out. Um, there are some proposals around an implementation or compliance mechanism. Um, and we will need to work on dispute settlement um, to take on board the interests um, to take on board the interests of parties to UNCLOS who want to preserve Part 15, but at the same time the interests of uh, non-parties um, who who uh, are a little concerned about taking the mutatis mutandis approach um, that we see in the fish stocks agreement. Um, I've previously said that, um, and I continue to maintain that um, in this process, what we want to do is to work towards a fair, balanced and effective uh, treaty. And specifically in relation to the development of an effective treaty, and as I've reflected before, it, is, uh, it has to be a treaty that is universal and implementable, meaning to say we need to get on board as many people as we can to do the things that we say we want to do. Um, uh, and therefore, it's important for us to work towards um, consensus. Uh, I think that uh, based on the developments that happened in the fourth um, uh, session, if we continue um, at the pace and if we put, uh, you know, and if we continue to work intersessionally um, and maintain that momentum that we uh, developed during the fourth session and hopefully to get all the resources that I need to organize the fifth session, um, that um, I'm quite optimistic that we will be able to make great strides um, at the fifth session. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Lee. And uh, your role reminds me of uh, Ambassador uh, Tommy Cole 40 years ago. Uh, he presided at the third conference, uh, UN conference on the law of the sea leading to the adoption of the UNCLOS. So your law is very critical and I, I'm sure that it will be uh, su successful uh, leading to a new agreement as a part of the in, uh, living instrument. So uh, 
Very good, thank you. And uh, now we move to the fourth uh, speaker and also the final speaker of this panel and uh, doc Dr. Joanna Masop. Uh, she's a social professor uh, in the uh, Associate Professor of Law in the University of, uh, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. She is also associate dean in charge of research in the faculty of law, and uh, she is on the advisory board and uh, several uh, of several uh, international journals, and also she is recently nominated as the uh, arbitrator, a conciliator list, and the anchors. So, and uh, Joanna, the floor is yours now. Um, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, I want to, first of all, along with other members of this panel, thank the organizers for their very kind invitation to participate in this important conference. I really regret that I am unable to attend in person, but I send my warm wishes to all those in Singapore. I have been very privileged recently to attend the BBNJ negotiations as an observer on the New Zealand delegation. Of course, these comments are my own and don't reflect the position of the New Zealand government, but it is the observing of those negotiations that have prompted me to take a look at the role of implementing agreements in the uh, evolution of the law of the sea. So the, pers the, the purpose, of course, is to consider um, how these implementing agreements contribute towards UNCLOS's status as a living treaty. Um, I, um, want to consider, you know, what, for what purpose does UNCLOS continue to evolve? What matters are sufficiently serious to prompt the international community to build on UNCLOS through an implementing agreement? Um, and lastly, whether community interests in the oceans will be represented by the new BBNJ agreement. Whenever I think about UNCLOS as a living instrument, I am often reminded of Philip Ellett's article from 1992, which he titled Mare Nostrum, Our Sea. In this fascinating philosophical examination of the convention, Ellett postulated that UNCLOS has the potential to move beyond individual state interests to reflect a new awareness of the common interests of all people in the ocean. He certainly doesn't deny that UNCLOS, like most international treaties, is an aggregation of state interests. Quite clearly, the convention represented a grand compromise in which all states got something that reflected their state interests. However, he also argued that UNCLOS signaled a move towards more community interests. And examples of this included the use of common heritage, equity, and protection of the environment. In the article, Alec describes the convention as a slow motion metamorphosis, which is a really lovely image. But his argument was that if the social interest can be upheld, UNCLOS can enter into the reality of international society as a powerful creative force, preparing the minds of all to manage a world in which global social problems call for solutions that far exceed the potentialities of traditional diplomacy and traditional international law. That is definitely a, a worthy ambition. But Alet is not the only one to recognize that a metamorphosis of this nature is desirable. As just one example, in 2019, the IPBS report on biodiversity called for a transformational approach to current methods of protecting biodiversity in both terrestrial and marine environments in light of the significant downward trend in biodiversity. So one goal for, for the rest of this presentation is to consider whether implementing agreements, including the one currently under negotiation, have moved us towards Alet's vision of a mare nostrum. I won't dwell on this slide. Judge Haider um, very, um, lovely, very nicely illustrated the various ways in which UNCLOS is a constitution, um, but also is open for amendment. Um, 
Although UNCLOS doesn't specifically provide for inf implementing agreements, it of course is consistent with the role of UNCLOS as a framework convention that new agreements can develop principles and approaches to achieve the goals of the convention. Forty years after the conclusion of UNCLOS, we are able to acknowledge its successes, but it is also clear that UNCLOS has not always managed to achieve outcomes that fully support a sustainable use of the ocean. Um, gaps in UNCLOS were obvious almost from the time it was negotiated, as Dr. Ridings has clearly illustrated. So to start with, I want to briefly review the implementing agreements that have been concluded to date. And again, I can be brief because they have been mentioned already by, um, by earlier speakers. The 1994 Agreement on Part 11 on seabed mining is, is definitely a fascinating document. Um, from the conclusion of UNCLOS in 1982, it was clear that the provisions on seabed mining were difficult for some developed countries to accept particularly those that had already undertaken exploration of the mineral resources of the area. The 1984 agreement undertook to amend part 11 to make it, uh, the convention part, um, more acceptable to those states. And specifically, um, article two provides that unclos in the 1994 agreement are to be applied as a single document but if inconsistencies exist, the 94 agreement prevails. Thinking in terms of Allet's analysis, there's little doubt that this agreement was purely a political reflection of state interests and the need to ensure that industrialized states would agree to apply the convention. So although um, it is a very important role in, in the living status of the convention, it doesn't contribute as much to the move towards the common interests. Again, Dr. Ridings has already given us a comprehensive review of the fish stocks agreement, and I don't need to say too much about it. But I do want to dwell on a couple of remarkable aspects of the fish stocks agreement. First, the agreement was negotiated extremely quickly by international standards. Um, as uh, Dr. Ridings mentioned, the Rio conference in 1992 called for this issue to be addressed, sorry, and um, the fish stocks agreement was concluded in 1995. And I think the, the, the speed of this reflects the fairly wide consensus at the time that something was needed to be done about the importance of cooperation in relation to straddling and highly migratory fish stocks. My second point uh, is that although Article 4 of the fish stocks agreement states that it is to be interpreted in a manner consistent with the convention, I would argue a couple of aspects of the agreement went well beyond the convention. Uh, Judge Haidar mentioned that the agreement um, developed international law significantly. The most prominent example of this is the provision in Article 8.3 that requires states to either join an existing RFMO or agree to apply the conservation and management measures of that RFMO if it wants to access the fish stock. Um, and I would argue that this requirement takes the obligation to cooperate that is in, in UNCLOS to a, a new uh, and quite necessary standard, um, which essentially cut across the traditional understanding of freedom of the high seas. The third point I want to make, um, and again, Dr. Ridings mentioned this as well, is that although the fish stocks agreement hasn't achieved universal coverage, it has had remarkable impact beyond the parties to the fish stocks agreement. Many regional fisheries management organizations have revised their operations to conform to provisions of the fish stocks agreement. And RFMOs established after the agreement have often followed the provisions of the fish stocks agreement. Thus, non-parties to the fish stocks agreement find themselves bound to apply the standards of the fish stocks agreement through the RFMOs they participate in. And I think this um, is an interesting perspective model for the BBNJ agreement. In my view, the fish stocks agreement does represent a stage in the slow motion metamorphosis. Of course, it is in the interest of individual states to ensure that straddling and highly migratory species are not overexploited. But the fish stocks agreement also demonstrates a willingness to move beyond pure state interests to build a legal regime that supports sustainability in the high seas. 
Moving on now to also incorporate discussion of the BBNJ Treaty, Ambassador Lee has already provided a wonderful overview of the process, so I won't be repeating any of that today. Instead, in the next slides, I want to put the BBNJ negotiations in the context of the other implementing agreements. The first thing that is notable about these negotiations is that comparative to the first two implementing agreements, BBNJ has taken a considerable amount of time, even when you allow for the disruptions caused by COVID. The first two agreements took between three and four years to negotiate. However, the issues of BBNJ were first discussed in an informal working group that met in 2006, which I actually attended, um, and the process has actually um, almost been as long as my academic career. But hopefully, we are in the final stages of these negotiations. In part, the length of the negotiation process reflects the complexity of the problems involved. In fact, when you compare the features of the three implementing agreements, it's easy to see why this process has taken so much longer. The BBNJ agreement potentially intersects with a wide range of activities and the um, international uh, bodies and frameworks that already exist. The instruction of the General Assembly to not undermine the existing bodies and frameworks has led to an intense debate about how the new treaty will work with respect to those bodies. One real advantage of the fish stocks agreement in comparison was that negotiators were clear that the new agreement would impact on RFMOs and how they worked. So they had a much clearer basis on which to begin. Related to this issue is the role for new bodies created by the BBNJ Treaty. A key part of the negotiations has been the role of these institutions. In my view, this is one of the most useful and potentially important aspects of the agreement. As Tara Davenport earlier observed, the absence of a decision-making body with broad authority has prevented states from easily addressing new and important uses of the sea. This may change with the BBNJ Treaty, but the role of the institutions has not been easy to resolve. So in thinking about the comparisons between the speed of concluding the BBNJ Treaty and the earlier agreements, one must take into account the very particular geopolitical circumstances that we find ourselves in today. This is a time in which some countries have become so concerned about potential threats to UNCLOS that they formed the Friends of UNCLOS group of countries designed to express support for the regime. We are seeing competing visions around the basic framework and the role of dispute settlement starting to emerge. What has been encouraging is to see that most states are engaging with the BBNJ process in good faith. However, states have come to the discussion, discussion from very different starting points. Unlike the situation with earlier implementing agreements, there seems to be little ambition to implicitly amend provisions of UNCLOS, as potentially you could argue happened in the fish stocks agreement. Instead, some states have argued that inclusion of provisions intended to update and modernize UNCLOS would be undermining the convention, although this view is not the majority. Some observers have recalled that in some quarters, there is also little desire to introduce many new obligations on states beyond what is already in UNCLOS. So in some, the final agreement is like, unlikely to result in a significant change to the underlying law of the sea. However, one of the um, real potentials of the agreement is the incorporation of principles and processes from international environmental law. And in the draft text, we are seeing a move towards wider incorporation of these approaches. And I think this also offers potential for strong development. The hope is that the treaty will be concluded at the next IGC in August. And as Ambassador Lee has noted, there's certainly a can-do spirit that emerged at IGC 4. However, um, I would argue that there are a few areas where it is still hard to see the path forward. In particular, the legal regime for MGRs has been highly controversial for a long time. And although uh, Ambassador Lee rightly noted that there are some movements to a common ground, a very large and significant gap still remains in the positions of the parties. One of the strengths of UNCLOS was that the package approach meant that all states benefited from the treaty and most had to concede on their optimal outcomes. At this point, we need to be thinking what the motivation for states 
to agree to the package will be, especially for countries that are the largest users of the high seas. And in my view, this will be crucial for the final stage. So in conclusion, is the BBNJ discussion likely to lead to the metamorphosis that Alice imagined? There is no doubt that a large group of states are keen to see an ambitious treaty that will materially improve the management of activities threatening the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. There are also a large group of states keen to extend the principle of common heritage of mankind that Allet thought was so helpful to cover marine genetic resources. However, one of the handbrakes on making progress is the fact that for some key states, there is a reluctance to agree to something that will have an impact on existing activities. This is despite us knowing that the existing approaches to managing areas beyond national jurisdiction is not always leading to successful outcomes. I think she's... Sorry, Joanna, sorry, uh, you've gone silent. Um, did you, is she uh, on mute? So, I'm not sure. Okay. Hi, uh, Joanna, Joanna, sorry. Hi, Joanna. You, uh, we, we missed the last two minutes of your, um, uh, your presentation. Did you, uh, are you muted? Maybe, yeah. Uh... There's a technical problem. Yes. I mean, no, it's their side, her side. Okay. Sorry, Joanna, there's something wrong on your side. Um, yeah, do you want to use the chat just to let us know uh, if you're able to correct the issue? Okay. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear now? Yes, yes, can. Okay. Sorry, have, how much time do I have left? Am I... Uh, I think if you can just wrap up in the next minute, that would okay. be great. No, that's right. And sorry about the technology. Um, it's always difficult. Um, so I might actually leave it there. The points on my slide are the importance of um, ensuring that the COP has uh, enough authority to develop um, a future um, leaning approach to a body of work. Uh, and also um, the utility of including a, an obligation um, a general obligation for states in the general um, section of the agreement, which I'm happy to expand on in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, for your very excellent uh, presentation. And uh, there's a lot of uh, questions uh, in your pre uh, presentation actually uh, relating to the 1994 agreement about the principle of common heritage of mankind, whether it is still uh, living or it is uh, compromised by the uh, uh, late agreement. And also you mentioned the challenge to the traditional uh, view of freedom of fishing and the freedom of fishing is still uh, contained in the anchors, but uh, whether it is uh, still implementable, uh, there's a question mark after the adoption of the 1994 uh, agreement. So all these, uh, uh, we need to think uh, uh, deeper and deeper. Uh, because of uh, uh, because of timing and we have uh, uh, about uh, 50 minutes for uh, questions and uh, comments. And uh, first of all, we would like to uh, take questions from the floor in Singapore. Thank you. Does anyone? Oh, yes, we have a question. Um, go ahead. Yeah. There's a mic. Yeah, thank you, uh, Neil Liu from uh, Macquarie University, Sydney. Just uh, to pick up uh, Joanna's point about that uh, geopolitical environment for the BBNJ negotiation, uh, I do <laughs> got a question for Ambassador Lee. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to observe some other negotiations related to ocean and fisheries in recent years, uh, which made me feel very pessimistic because what I, what I witnessed was like, I, I call it a kind of a spillover of the geopolitical tension uh, from a core issue that just spilled towards different 
areas of the of the of the of the, of the world. And but when I was in New York last two weeks ago, I, I, I was very, I was very, as I told you, I was very kind of uh, pleased because the atmosphere is very constructive and also quite uh, kind of, uh, as you said, there is a momentum. So I'm just being curious, Ambassador Lee, what, what, what is in your magic toolbox <laughs> to facilitate this kind of atmosphere, which is, which we took it for granted for too long, but now it's so rare. So I, I'm really curious about that. Thank you. To oh, yes. Yes. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for that question. There is no magic um, um, involved. Uh, this is not something that I, not something that I speak of uh, um, um, very frequently. Uh, but uh, in fact, I hardly ever speak of this. But since you put me on the spot, <laughs> um, I see my role as the President, um, first of all, to say that I'm, it's really an honor and a privilege um, to be the president of the BBNJ uh, conference. Um, and the intergovernmental conference came at a time when, uh, you know, multilateralism, uh, many people said, was under threat. And um, uh, I think uh, it comes as no surprise that Singapore is a huge supporter of multilateralism. Um, and and uh, and you know really the 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 my my thought is that my thought is that multilateralism isn't simply about the outcomes. Of course, the outcomes matter, but it's also about the process um, uh, to create that environment, that atmosphere where states can believe that they can work together. Uh, and come together and build good outcomes. I think that's been what I've been working um, towards. I, I know it sounds a bit naive for me to say this, but really I've been consciously um, trying to build an environment where um, people feel like they, are, they can be friends. Um, they know each other very well. They can work well together because it makes the process of negotiations, um, it facilitates the process of negotiations um, because we have that sense of, uh, uh, that sense of togetherness, that we're all in this together. We are working for a common purpose um, towards a good outcome. Um, and that's what I've been um, trying to do. Um, so I really uh, rely a lot on my um, bureau. We try to make sure, or I, you know, we try to make sure that our meetings uh, proceed very smoothly. Um, we typically, I, 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 I want to thank all the delegations that to date we've not really seen any process or procedural debates. Um, in the in in our process, this is not to give anybody any ideas. Uh, um, I think we should continue the way uh, the way that we are doing um, uh, to to demonstrate that uh, when states come together, work together um, for a common purpose, there is a lot that we can achieve together. Um, so that's. You know, because I've been in other processes where there's a lot of argument, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, challenges to the process, to the procedure um, that I try, I try, I continue to try and put in my efforts to make sure that our process is a process where uh, um, we can really focus on the substance um, towards building a good outcome. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Oh, okay. Uh, Natalie? Thanks very much. Uh, Natalie Klein from UNSW Sydney, and, and thank you to all the presenters for the excellent presentations. It's been great to, to listen to them. Uh, the question I had was probably more directed to Judge Hyder and looking at uh, the different uh, tools or mechanisms, if you like, uh, for adapting to new challenges for UNCLOS, but I 
wondered where you really saw the position for informal agreements. You did refer to soft law when you were talking about uh, the standards that can come in through rules of reference, and you mentioned also the UN General Assembly resolutions. Uh, but it, we know that they're being used all the time in oceans governance. Of course, there are risks and limits uh, to their use, but I was just interested in your perspectives in terms of where you see them fitting within your framework, or whether that is something else that needs to be considered, or if you just see them as too risky for various reasons. Uh, yourself and that we need to avoid them more and perhaps go through these processes we're currently going through with the BBMJ to try and reach uh, agreements on particular issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, can I respond? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, my my, I think my intention with my, my, with my short statement was to illustrate that there are various ways in which states do uh, adapt the convention and, and, the, and the whole law of framework uh, to uh, new challenges. Um, so uh, I think it is uh, useful to have those different types of methods because uh, you, you may have one method uh, that fits uh, a certain area and another method fitting the other. Uh, there was a reference to the um, uh, the rule of reference and to General Assembly resolutions. I think those are, those are two very different things because um, on the one hand we are we are talking about soft law, uh, the, 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 the resolutions of the General Assembly. I think the soft law can be quite useful. It's after all, it, it's really all about the implementation, and not about necessarily the, the the legal status of obligations. So if if the uh, uh, resolutions carry uh, political weight and they are implemented, then the 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 uh, the goal is is reached. So I, I think it is useful to to use soft law also. Rule of reference, I, I think, is more about you know, the, the difference is that, uh, for example, if we take the IMO, uh, developing several different standards, taking into account uh, new developments, some of those uh, 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 decisions by, by the IMO will indirectly become uh, a, a, a part of the uh, legal obligations of the Law of the Sea Convention because of the reference in the Law of the Sea Conventions to those standards. So there's, a, there's some difference between those. But my, my main message is really that we should take advantage of all of these different ways of uh, developing the law of the sea to adapt to the, the new challenges. So one, one approach does not exclude the other. Okay, uh, maybe we take one more question from the audience. Is there, uh, yes, please, Judge Corona. And then we can go to the Zoom questions. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. For an interesting um, session, I was not going to take the floor because you should be opportunity to have the perspective of Judge Ida and uh, Professor Masop regarding the adoption of the convention. Um, I do agree that there should be room yeah. for creativity. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Judge Kuma, could you speak into the mic? It's just that the Zoom participants yeah, yeah. can't hear. Yeah. I was saying that I yeah, good, good. thank um, the panelists for their presentations. But and uh, for me personally, more interesting here on this occasion is to have the perspectives of George Haider and Professor Mossop. Um, and uh, it's interesting too, I know they're here in their personal capacities, that George Haida is coming from Iceland, I believe, and George Mossop from New Zealand. Um, yes, we should be creative in terms of implementing the convention, but I don't think we should necessarily sacrifice the desideratum, as it were, which um, you know, led to the adoption of the, of the convention. I think that's why it's very interesting. I don't believe, will excuse me, 
Um, I don't know whether Judge Haida participated in the convention, in the adoption of the convention, or negotiated in the negotiation of the convention, or Professor Mossop, but it's very good to recall the background of the UNCLOS, and as I say, to hear them today, it's, um, for me, it's very interesting. Thank you. Any comments from uh, Raja Haida and uh, Joanna in response? I, I could perhaps just make a brief comment. Um, thank you very much for your comments, Judge. That's uh, very um, important for us to remember that UNCLOS does provide that foundational starting point for all of our work um, in developing and moving the, the law of the sea forward. Um, and you're right that there are some fundamental parts of UNCLOS that you know, we, we can't open up for renegotiation because of the difficulty that that would create. But I, I do think that we are seeing a, a really wonderful attempt to move the law forward in ways that it's possible to do so in recognition of the, the, the real challenges that we're facing as a global community and, and currently, especially in relation to marine environmental protection. Thank you. Can you hide that? Well, uh, well I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, actually the, the, the Fish Talks Agreement was my, was my uh, uh, conference, my first conference. So uh, I, I'm always very attached to the fish stocks agreement as a consequence, also coming from Iceland, of course, a big fisheries nation. But I'm, 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 I've always emphasized the importance of preserving the integrity of the convention and the, the packet steel. So I think we have to be very careful in, you know, um, there's a certain balance, you know, you have to uh, preserve the packets, but you also have to be, be open to developing the law in 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 in, uh, in 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 light of you know new developments. Uh, if if the convention were not a living instrument, uh, alive and kicking, so to say, it it it, it would be a very a detrimental. Uh, uh, it would be very detrimental to the law of the sea. So so we have to find that balance and and identify those areas where uh, amendments may be needed uh, or developments. Uh, and this is where we have all these different methods to, to achieve that, uh, that, that I mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Possibly we would, because of the time limit, I think uh, we just take one question from the chat box. Uh, yeah, uh, Prof Cho, sorry, um, Nilifa, my big boss, has said that we can extend till 4.35. So okay, we have a few okay, more minutes uh, for okay. questions. But yeah. Um, perhaps, yeah, there are two questions. Um, on the chat, one is to uh, Judge Hyder. I'll just read them out, and mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah. So it says, "What would the, what would be? Gosh, I can't read. What would be the harmonization of the consequences of the different methods you mentioned? For example, in the South China Sea Award in 2016, the definition of islands and rocks has been clarified. However, such clarification is somewhat different from state practice." How can the island regime be harmonized? Are states required to change their practice? And uh, mm -hmm. while uh, Judge Hyde is thinking of that, uh, Joanna, there's a question from Professor Ronan Long. Uh, Prof Long, would you like to just ask it live? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just uh, congratulations to Ambassador Lee. And uh, the BBNJ process is really followed uh, both the spirit of the Third Love the Sea Conference and indeed supports an international legal order uh, at a uh, multilateral level. So we're, we're very proud of your achievements and the achievements of the IGC. Uh, my question goes to uh, Joanna Massa. And Joanna, you, you spoke about the importance of community interests and indeed Philip Allotts, a very famous uh, article in the American Journal of International Law. And my question is, um, do, do you think that the relatively poor representation of industry uh, representative bodies at the BBNJ processes is, is, is a weakness uh, since their inception? Okay, thank you uh, so bearing much. Bearing in mind uh, community interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Prof. I'm sorry, we have, uh, just so that we can get the questions, we have a question from Nilifa. Or, or no, yes, okay. For, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, congratulations to this wonderful panel. It really was, I think there's so many issues brought up that we could discuss for much longer. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to be quick and just ask my question to Penelope, to Penny, uh, who will be with joining us uh, in 2023 in the commission. We're looking forward to having you. Um, in terms of the um, fish stocks agreement, and uh, which was negotiated for addressing specific stocks, as you outlined, but a decision taken um, uh, by the General Assembly to extend it to other stocks as well. Um, my question has to do with, and a little bit with Natalie, um, talking about informal lawmaking, and by the way, Natalie has a new book out on this topic, so I will promote that a little bit. Um, the advisory opinion, and the ITLOS advisory opinion on IUU fishing, which was really, I think, a very important advisory opinion. Can you, as a, someone who's an expert, can you speak of the influence that had within RFMOs um, in terms of um, impact? Because when we're looking at these types of tools, I think it's important to know what impact are they having. And I think an advisory opinion is a very powerful tool, actually. So that's my question. Okay. Then uh, please, uh, uh, there are altogether three questions. One for Judge Haida, one for uh, Dr. Dryden, one for uh, Joanna. Yeah. So if but, I if I start, yeah, you start, yeah, please. Uh, so. This is a very good question about the harmonization of, of, of the different methods that I mentioned, the different methods to adapt the law of sea to new challenges. So what happens if there is inconsistency between some of these methods dealing with the same issue? And uh, the, the, the example was taken from the, the South China Sea Award regarding interpretation of Article 121, Paragraph 3 concerning rocks. Uh, and then that the, the state practice might not be consistent with what was stated in that award. Well, I, I think one has to, of course, bear in mind that uh, uh, an award like this is, formally speaking, only binding on the parties. So uh, the extent to which this award will have influence on the interpretation of this provision uh, in the future will, will depend on the receipt by, by, by states. It will depend on opinions of states and so on. I think that there, there has been a lot of writing on, on this part of the judgment. I, I think for the most part, this, this award is rather uncontroversial, but I think the part on our Article 121, Paragraph 3 is somewhat controversial. Uh, and I happen to be one of those that may not agree totally with that uh, interpretation in, the, in that award. So, but this is a very this is a very good question. But we have very short time, so I, I think I'll just leave it there. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Maybe we can ask uh, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Riding. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Nella, for, for that question. And uh, I agree with you that the uh, it lost advisory opinion was very uh, was a significant opinion, uh, and particularly some of the separate opinions and particularly Judge Pike that um, Judge Heider referred to. It, where it is particularly uh, useful is in, in trying to give further uh, substance to flag state responsibilities uh, and particularly the due diligence obligation to exercise those responsibilities. How it flows into RFMOs is the compliance schemes that they, most RFMOs have various schemes to in, encourage uh, compliance with their conservation and management measures. So it, it's, it's a process uh, of uh, ensuring that these schemes will um, uh, get state, uh, states to better exercise their flag state responsibilities. So the framework that was provided by the advisory opinion uh, not expressly goes into the compliance schemes, but it's um, it sort of uh, through its substance uh, ensures that these compliance schemes 
are better able to ensure that um, states do exercise their responsibilities in the proper way. So I will just leave it at that. Okay, we can Joanna, have, um, Yeah, uh, okay. one more minute for uh, Prof Mossop to answer. Yeah. Um, I, I know I'm standing between you and a break. Um, I'll just say, Ronan, um, great question. Um, I think there's not just been um, an absence of the industry, uh, apart from the cable laying industry, who've been very active, um, that perhaps also the science community has also been a little absent um, from, from, the dis from the discussions. Um, however, we have had a very good representation by civil society who, um, who do incorporate some of those, um, probably not industry views, but some of the other communities. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Because of time limit, I, I think uh, I have to close the panel. And uh, as, as we uh, already uh, listened, that uh, this is the best panel of the day, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. Very stimulating, very informative, and, and also, also uh, receive a lot of uh, feedback from the audience. So finally, I would like to thank, uh, thank you all, all the panelists, and uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, particularly uh, Professor Ko and Professor Ora, uh, for organizing such kind of very, very important, significant event in Singapore. Okay, thank you all. And I close the session. Thank you, Thank you very much, Prof Cho and the panelists.